Now it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague Michael Moore. Um, Dr. Moore is um, a Global Navigation Satellite Systems Scientist with the Positioning Program in Geoscience Australia. He got his PhD from the ANU on mitigating site-specific errors in geodetic time series. And Michael is currently the team lead for the uh, Positioning Software Toolkit and is responsible for the coordination of the International GNSS Service, the IGS Analysis Centers operating around the world. Now, the talk today is going to be a particularly interesting one, uh, if not a noisy one. Uh, the project was started about three years ago when RMRT, the Bureau of Meteorology, NGA, wanted to take an opportunity to see if we could take our GPS processing solutions and use them for a completely different purpose. And basically, for geologists who spend often a lot of time thinking about the Earth, it was an opportunity to look up rather than down. And that's uh, a very interesting uh, change of perspective, if nothing else. But what's really unique about this processing approach is that it is an inherently very simple approach. We're using only publicly available data, and we're using that to improve the weather forecast. And this is something that's been done around the world by weather services, and it's something that's now being routinely used by the Bureau of Meteorology uh, and by the UK Met Office. And this is where our products really uh, help improve those routine um, forecasts, but also we are experimentally going to be improving particular types of forecasts into the future. So there's an area where we're really looking forward to future development as well. So with that, I want to hand over to Mike to give uh, give your cloudy with the chance of noise talk. Mike, over to you. Oh, thank you, Martin. Thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for the lovely title. Um, that was quite an innovative title, it's a nice one. Uh, for this talk. Um, it's uh, really nice to be given a chance to talk about this project. It's been um, a lot of fun. Um, we've worked with some really interesting people and it's nice to see that we can get um, some interesting results that can be applied to um, people um, in everyday life. Um, so yeah, I'll try and take you through what, what we've done, what we've been working on. Um, so what I'd like to try and convince you is that by taking um, observations from GPS satellites, which may be around about uh, 20,000 20, kilometers away or three times the Earth radius, um, from those sort of observations that are meant to be aimed at um, getting a position, we can actually work out what's happening in the atmosphere. And once you have a network of um, GNS, GPS satellites going, we can actually um, produce results that are really quite reliable. Um, but I think many of you will be thinking, what we're hoping to do is that those results will be so liable so you don't get caught out in um, heavy wet weather or storm events um, and to help with the forecasting systems in that way. Um, but I think you'll be wondering, how can we actually um, help with weather forecasting? And the key to that is about um, measuring the water vapor that's in the atmosphere. And what I'm hoping to convince you is we can do it more accurately than we can probably get predictions of meatballs and donuts falling down. So before we dive into the actual mechanics of what we're doing, I'd like to take a step back and talk about the atmosphere and um, go through what is, um, what is it we're actually trying to do. So if I go back to my original diagram that we had beforehand, we forgot this orange circle here, and that's representing the Earth. We have a radius of around about 6,400 kilometers there. And sitting above the Earth, radius of around about a 1,000 um, kilometers above um, the surface of the Earth is the atmosphere. That's around about a sixth of the Earth's radius there. So it's actually quite a thin shell that's going in there. And what we're trying to determine from GPS observations is what, what is actually happening in that region. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at the vertical structure of the atmosphere and break it down a bit more. Um, if we go take a vertical profile of um, a slice here, um, take a look at this. If we look at this um, bar here, that represents the height above the Earth's surface. We go here. And within the first 15 kilometers above the Earth's surface, 90% of that atmospheric mass is sitting just in that first 15 k's. Um, if we go a further 30 kilometers up, 
we're looking at around about 99% of the atmospheric mass that um, that's around the, the Earth. And if we go further 970 kilometers up, we, we, can't basic, we can't basically distinguish between what is the atmosphere and what is basically space, the interplanetary medium. What we're interested in for weather forecasting is where all the action is happening, where all the ma majority of the mass is, and that is around about um, 15 kilometers and lower. And that region is called the troposphere. It's a Greek word for turning and mixing. So that's where all the um, dynamics of the weather system is happening. Um, if you turn your mind back to high school or back, you'll, you'll remember the water cycle. So effectively, we're trying to get a measure of the mixing of the atmosphere that's going on. Try, um, it's, going, it's quite complicated. So if you were to think about taking um, a drop of water from the ocean um, and letting that evaporate, um, it'll go through a life cycle of um, forming clouds. Um, and then at some point, it's gonna precipitate out of the clouds, um, either fall back directly into the ocean or run off down through rivers and lakes and return and the cycle repeats again. Um, and generally, um, that water will sort of circulate within a, um, a period of around about seven to 10 days going through that cycle. Um, from what we know, about 85% of that, um, the water in the atmosphere is actually evaporated from oceans. And 15% of that, the remaining 15% comes from freshwater lakes or rivers or um, other sources just um, precipitating out of, off of the ground. Okay, um, so understanding where the water vapour is and um, what is there is important, but it's also, um, it also gives you an idea of where um, rainfall might happen. But what else is important for um, knowing and understanding the water vapour is um, it gives meteorologists an understanding of the heat transfer. So it plays a big impact on um, how, how much heat is in the system and how much energy in the system. And that can help with um, understanding how severe storms might be or um, what, what sort of events might occur. Um, so what we're trying to do here is um, understand a bit more about the atmospheric water vapour. Um, and what we're trying to do is get a better understanding of how to aid with water, um, with weather prediction. Um, so understanding the tropics water is essential um, to, due to its complexity and um, how much it mixes and how much it changes um, spatially and temporarily. Um, it's also um, really important um, for climatological studies, um, trying to understand the impact of the greenhouse effect um, over um, a long time series as we go through. So how on earth do we work out um, how much water or water vapour is in the atmosphere? Well, um, meteorologists have been um, sending basically balloons up with um, sensors on them, um, radio sonds. And they give us a nice profile of um, how much water vapor is in the atmosphere and um, where it's found. Um, and what they basically know, um, if they go through, they find that about 50% of the water vapor is um, um, in the first one and a half kilometers of um, the surface of the earth. Um, five kilometers above the surface, surface it's around about another 43% of the atmosphere and so on. Once we get up to above seven kilometers, the, the, the amount of water vapor becomes to become insignificant. Um, the, the sensors that they've been using on the radio sounds have, have changed with time and um, have um, improved um, that these days they're putting on GPS modules and um, to keep track of the of the of the radio sound and um, they basically can have a temperature pressure and a humidity sensor in there and um, they release them on occasions. Um, now that's been going on for a number of years. There's quite a, a large network that covers the global um, area with um, radio sound points all around the world. Um, and they're getting released in remote locations such as Antarctica with that, and it has been um, going on for many years. It's been the staple of weather forecasting for the last 50 years. Um, so where do we enter? Um, how on earth do geologists help out on this system? Um, so Typically, when you use GPS, um, which is 
people are getting an accuracy of around about five meters when they use their mobile phone or um, a handheld unit. Or, or these days, their watch, they're getting around about five meter of accuracy. What we're interested um, at Geoscience Australia in the Positioning Australia section um, is trying to achieve um, a higher level accuracy looking at the carrier phase measurements. And we're trying to get an accuracy of around about five millimeters. Um, and that is being done through a lot of work um, in terms of understanding the effects of the ionosphere and the troposphere and taking that out of our processing scheme. Um, having a good amount of time in studying the impact of the satellite clocks and the receiver clocks that are tracking the observations um, that go through. And um, understanding the orbit dynamics of these satellites, um, how well we can predict where a satellite is any particular point in time. Once we are able to model or estimate for each of these error sources, we can start getting the positioning down to a lower level, a higher level of accuracy. And um, what we can use for that sort of application support is trying to determine the reference frame, um, trying to understand how the shape of the Earth is changing, um, what is happening to the gravity field, and how is the Earth wobbling. Um, and that's been great for Jodis. We love looking at that and um, trying to get things down to a high level degree and understand what's happening on. Um, in order to do that, we actually need to have a very precise tracking network in there, a very well established tracking network here. Um, here's some of the work that's being done with the Positioning Australia group where they actually um, go to a lot, a lot of effort to make sure that the monumentation and the instruments that we use to track the GPS signals are um, actually embedded into the, the bedrock. So we're actually measuring the, the change in um, the crustal motion of the, the continent. Um, and as that gets built up, um, the then result there is we have um, uh, a nice uh, a pillar set up now, often it has a, a weather station attached to it. So you're measuring the temperature, pressure and humidity at that station. And it's well backed up with um, a good com um, power source unit, solar panels to um, cover power outages and um, redundant comms so we can get a good time series coming in consistently and constantly. Um, once we have that kind of infrastructure in place, we can start looking at the crustal motion um, for Australia and we can get a good idea of the tectonics of how um, that is moving. Um, I think a lot of you have seen that we're moving around about seven centimetres per year to the, to the northeast. Um, but what has been interesting is what um, researchers have done has taken um, that sort of observations that we get from the tracking network and taken it to the next level. Um, at ANU, they've looked at a lot of um, the, the impact of earthquakes on um, the reference frame in Australia. And this is um, a snippet of a result from Paul Tregoning, where he's looked at the impact of the Macquarie earthquake um, that happened um, just um, where the red line is distinguished here. And what we can see is that an earthquake that was um, way, way down towards Macquarie Island, much further to the south, was actually having an impact on the um, change in um, the north component um, from Hobart. And increasingly, that's as we get further north. So we can see the impact of um, a large earthquake going all the way through to Australia. Um, so we can see it to quite a high degree of what's going on um, through the Earth's deformation out there. Um, this is um, another signal that um, Gurung picked up in his time series processing. Um, we, we noticed a, a large change in the height component um, in processing. And um, when the, the site operator went, actually got out there, he said that he had a bit of gardening work to do. And once that was um, trimmed back, um, the time series returned back to normal as well. Um, so um, the, the other work that we're doing is really looking into the orbit dynamics of um, how the satellites behave. So we're very interested in um, the gravitational forces that get um, applied to the satellites, um, how much that time variable gravity um, impacts on the, the, the orbit of the satellite and the solar radiation pressure um, that um, exerts its force and uh, perturbs the nominal motion of the satellite. And once we've got all that stuff in, we can accurately model um, the GNSS signal. All right, so that's that's all very good for tectonics and looking at, um, at what's happening to the structure of the Earth. But um, what about the atmosphere? Um, so if I go back to my vertical profile, 
of um, what we have here. So we have um, a whole lot of GNSS satellites. And if we look at around about the 20,000 kilometer level, which is where GPS is sitting at, um, the signal passes through down here. So if we take it that we know the clocks very well of the satellites, um, how well they're behaving, um, and if we take it that we can um, estimate how well the receiver clocks are um, estimating, um, the signal as it passes down through will still have to go through this um, um, atmosphere on here. And that's what we're going to be um, trying to look at as we do our processing. Um, so if you go down a traditional path of um, how a GPS signal travels, from the time it gets transmitted from a GPS satellite, and the time it takes to actually get received at a station on um, sitting on the earth, um, it takes about uh, approximately 10 milliseconds, um, about a hundredth of a second to get from the satellite to the receiver. And as it passes through the troposphere, um, the higher components of it, the dry atmosphere, um, there's actually a delay of around about two nanoseconds. Now that doesn't sound like much, but as the signal is traveling at the speed of light, um, two nanoseconds will actually um, add two meters bias to the observations that we're um, ranging to to the satellite. Um, fortunately for us, the, the dry atmosphere is very predictable. So we, we really understand how well it behaves and we can actually apply accurate models and take that um, component of the delay out um, quite easily. Um, but the, the wet atmosphere is uh, a lot more um, unpredictable. So as we start getting below that um, nine kilometre or seven kilometre range, um, it gets very unpredictable um, how much troposphere, um, how much water vapour is in the atmosphere. And the amount of um, delay that we have in that signal, um, we, we can't apply a model to. Um, we have to actually estimate with that. And that can have an impact on um, the path length from the satellite to the receiver of around about one to 80 centimetres, depending on the conditions. Um, so let's just quickly go over that again. So if you have um, a signal on a sunny day in very dry conditions, um, you won't get very much delay um, due to the atmosphere. So I'll just shoot down um, at, at the sort of expected rate and the dry atmosphere will warm up pretty well. But if you have um, another day where it's rainy and cloudy and there's a lot of precipitation in the atmosphere, um, very heavy event, you can get a delay of around about 60 centimetres to, to the signal length there. And um, as you can imagine, those clouds could be sitting over here or they could be sitting over um, in another area, um, it could be quite spatially diverse. So the impact on individual ranges um, can be quite specific or um, just depending where you are um, observing. So it's quite spatially dependent on that. Um, so what we end up doing is, because we can't apply a model to it, we have to sort of um, estimate the, um, the amount of um, refraction due to the um, signal passing through um, the water vapor. And what we generally do is that, um, we take the elevation angle of which the satellite is observed at, and we apply a mapping function so that we go from um, actual elevation angles there, and then we um, uh, estimate how much of a delay it would have been through the atmosphere if it had just come through um, directly above us. Um, and once we've uh, taken a, a whole lot of measurements um, from satellites that are um, observed at different elevation angles and different azimuth ranges, we, we get an estimate of um, the zenith troposphere delay. And um, that's that's the measurements that we are um, passing on to the Bureau of Meteorology. So that will give us um, an estimate of how much water vapour there is in the column of atmosphere above an observing station. So go through there. Um, so once you have your observation, um, we, we built up a system um, uh, that took um, some of our existing processing that we're doing um, for the whole Australian um, stations that, are, that, that, that we're collecting. And we started testing it out and just to get an idea of um, what sort of signals we could see. And when we were prototyping it, um, Carl started um, to correlate um, 
the zenith troposphere delay that we see um, with time. So here we've got um, a change in UTC day. And we knew there was um, quite a heavy rainstorm in, um, uh, in Canberra, where, where we're based, um, as we go through. And what you can see is that the zenith troposphere delay gets larger and larger over time. Um, as the amount of water vapor um, increases in the atmosphere. And then all of a sudden there's something, there's an event that um, causes the precipitation of the water vapor. So that starts getting dumped out and we see less of a delay um, coming through as that, um, uh, as that water is coming out of the atmosphere and, and hitting the ground. And then we started seeing a gradual buildup there. So um, that was quite um, uh, encouraging to see that we could see those signals that were correlating um, quite well with the observations that were um, being obtained from uh, the, the, the Bureau of Meteorology websites, um, information of rain gauges and humidity, pressure temperature centers that we're seeing. Um, and the, to get that result, we were basically using um, a, a standard um, software package called Bernese, and we're putting it into the Amazon cloud. And we're using um, a precise point positioning processing strategy with a latency of around about an hour. Um, so once we had um, a bit of a better idea of how well, um, we had a bit of confidence that it was actually producing results that were on the truth, we decided to compare how well those actual observations were comparing to say, um, the weather forecasters will actually produce. And in Australia, um, they use the Access Weather Model and, and it's a joint um, effort with the UK Met Office as well, um, developing their numerical weather model. Um, so what we have here is a graph that um, Celine has produced. Um, and in the black dots is what we expect to get from the numerical weather model as we go um, over a couple of days of observations. And we had um, two processing um, uh, two processing runs we're looking at. Um, the, the GA Rapid, which is um, has a, lower, um, a longer latency of around about um, 18 hours, and the GA Ultra Rapid, which is basically being processed every hour, producing a solution um, on every hour. And what you can see when you look at the red and blue dots is, um, yes, there are a couple of spurious observations every now and then, but in general, um, the, it tends to follow the, the weather the numerical weather model quite closely as what they would expect to get from the zenith troposphere delay. Um, what we noticed is that during periods of um, when there was a change in the zenith troposphere delay, when there's a decrease in there, um, there was a quite a significant departure between the weather model and the observations we were obtaining. And that was happening um, at different locations um, all around Australia. So these are just um, from Stromlo and um, from Parks through there. Um, so what that told us is that um, it looks like that during dry periods, um, the, the GPS observations were correlating really well with the numerical model. But during wet periods, um, it looked like um, we were significantly different to the weather forecasting model. And that gave us some hope that um, these observations could actually be valuable and um, hopefully improve the, the weather model um, as we go through. So if you, if you take that, um, if we can get that from one station, and if we take what, we're, what is currently happening in, in Australia, um, so we're working with um, a lot of the state authorities and commercial providers in um, sort of unifying the data. We can take that data and start producing um, estimates of um, what the zenith troposphere delay is over a larger region and um, a denser part um, of Australia. And you take those observations and you add them in with the existing radio sign measurement that gives us a nice profile of there. Um, what we have is um, an observation of the water vapor that is very precise. It is nearly continuous. It's not something that gets um, happens every 12 hours. It's something that happens um, pretty much, we can produce a solution every hour and um, give an update um, of what's happening quite continuously. Um, with our network that's being rolled out and we can give quite a horizontally dense um, spatial coverage of what's happening in the atmosphere. And we can do it in quite um, a short period of time. Um, we can produce these results quite reliably on the hour, every hour with a low latency. And they are generally, quite, they are very reliable results that um, 
would be suitable for um, a production system or, or weather forecast. Um, so the next thing we did is um, we actually took it to the next level and um, we started to um, work a bit more closely with the Bureau of Meteorology, um, in particular um, John Le Marshall and um, uh, RMIT. And we started to um, input these observations um, directly into their new weather forecasting system. Um, so this is where you're taking all of the different observations, the temperature, the pressure, um, the satellite um, observations of wind, and then you're also adding in the GNSS um, estimates of the Zenith stroposphere delay. And what we did was this, um, using the new forecasting model, they're calling it the third generation access model, um, this had um, a much higher resolution um, than has previously been used in the weather forecasting system. And that was quite fortuitous to us, having something that was higher resolution and um, was able to deal with um, assimilating um, uh, samples of data at different um, epochs and being able to take that variation in time um, was um, um, made the utility of the genus observations um, uh, uh, even better. Um, what what they looked at was um, to try the try out the impact of this was um, using a one and a half kilometer grid. Um, they went through and modeled the atmosphere with eighty different vertical layers, and they ran it on basically um, getting results um, every hour on the hour as it came through. And they did it for a test period um, over Victoria. Um, around about 2017, from November the 30th to December the 4th. Um, and they chose this period because um, it had a period where there was no rain, um, there was some light rain, and there was some serious flooding happening during that period as well. And they wanted to see how well it would perform in a variety of um, weather conditions for that. Um, so if I take the first set of results that we um, achieved with a simulation model. Um, I'll just sort of walk you through um, what we have here. Um, what we have here um, on the left on A is what was um, previously the operational forecasting system model that was applied. And um, the results here you see are for the 24 hour, how much rainfall was predicted for 24 hours. And this is what was um, produced from the um, existing weather forecasting model. So there was expecting some light rain to um, just to the east of Melbourne and um, uh, uh, much less of a chance to the west of Melbourne down there. Um, once they changed to the 4D VAR axis model down here um, in B, they could see they got a much higher resolution picture of where the rainfall was going to occur. And um, they, they could see that it wasn't just to the um, east of Melbourne, they could see it was going to be a lot further to the east. So they were getting a better result there in that they were able to predict that it was going to be more towards Gippsland and less towards um, than Melbourne, um, where the, the rainfall was going to occur. Um, but um, it was very streaky towards the west of Melbourne um, and um, uh, around other areas. Um, when they took that same weather model and then introduced the GPS observations, and they, they, they were very happy with the results in that they got a much more um, consistent um, forecasting model of what was expected to happen to the east of Melbourne and a much higher resolution of um, where the rain bands were going to come through, um, all the way through down that way. So they were very happy with that result down there. Um, I just want to point out here, this is actually the um, total rainfall that was expected over 24 hours in, in millimetres. And in um, uh, this case, it's only at 40 millimetres there. Um, in the next slide, um, this is the period when there was uh, light rain. Um, and uh, in here, we have a chart where we're going from 40 millimetres, and now we're up to 400 millimetres. So the, the colour scale has changed. And um, again, we have the same pattern. Um, on the left, we have the previous um, operational model of what they're expecting to get in the forecast. Um, and then again, they applied their new um, uh, weather forecasting numerical model with um, 40 bar implemented. And then they added the GPS into there. And um, then again, they were getting a much better subjective result of where um, the rainfall was going to occur um, during light periods of rainfall. Um, 
And then uh, if we have a look at the next set of results, this is a period of where there was um, actual flooding occurring. And this is where GPS helped out a lot. So again, we have the same pattern. In the um, previous operational model they have there, they were expecting flooding to potentially occur um, all over um, eastern Melbourne, the eastern east of Melbourne that way. But by putting into the the new forecasting model, they again they got a, um, a much better result than than what they've previously been able to achieve. And adding in the GNS, the GPS observations, um, improved the solution um, significantly more as well. Um, and this was particularly um, uh, when you start looking at the the Melbourne metro region um, a little bit more closely, where the structure of the rainfall patterns were going to fall. Um, so, looking at the um, Looking at the, the, the rainfall patterns and trying to distinguish between is um, quite subjective. So um, what they, they also use um, to assess how well their um, forecasting models perform is uh, a metric called the fractional skill score. And um, what that means is um, they give a score of um, how well the forecast was for that. You know, um, did they predict the rainfall and the level of rainfall correct? and how correct that was. So if you got zero, it means um, you, you were nowhere we're right. Um, if you got one, then um, then the, the correction was um, perfect. You, you managed to forecast exactly what was going to happen and you got it right. So um, what we have here um, are two sets of results. Um, one where we're doing a 12 hour forecast um, with and without GPS, and one with an 18-hour forecast for um, the rain rate, um, looking at what was um, predicted for the um, rain for that thing. And um, in both of these cases, um, if you look at the 18-hour one, um, range the resolution, um, when you add GPS into it, um, the fractional score rate was higher um, for all scales and um, gave a much better um, gave a, a better solution uh, over an 18 hour forecast. And then um, if you look at the 12 hour forecast, you can see that um, GPS um, really improved um, the result quite a lot for in terms of the rain rate um, there. So what that tells us is that um, the, the impact of GPS and weather forecasting is um, not so much in the long, um, it's, it really has a good impact in the near real time side of um, the forecasting and um, getting the, the real time update and really understanding what is happening with the troposphere. Um, so if we go back to where we want to be, um, what we're taking at the moment is we're taking a, a station network of um, the, all over Australia. Um, we're taking GPS observations, and then from that, we're producing a whole lot of results that come out here. We're getting our um, cross promotion, um, getting results of how well the, the data is, and we're getting um, atmospheric solutions. Um, what we're now working with um, the Bureau of Meteorology is to look at how we can improve um, the, the latency of that result. Um, can we start doing this in real time? Um, the, the issue we have at the moment is we're reliant on Bernays, but um, fortunately we have a project that is looking at developing our own processing software um, called the Analysis Center Software Toolkit. And what that will do is that will um, allow us to not only process the, the GPS observations, but allow us to process the European, the Russian, um, the, the multi-GNS observations that we have um, for the whole of us. Um, for all of the navigation softwares that are going out there. Um, using our own software, we can um, crunch the numbers and go through there and start um, producing um, a wider range of products. So we can start producing our own orbits and clocks and um, start looking at refining these atmospheric products that we're prying with the Bureau of Metallurgy. And we'll be looking at doing that um, in real time. So um, we're hoping to release that software. Um, we've, we've done a um, released the orbit determination modeling component um, a couple of weeks ago, and we're just providing an update um, in the next day or two. 
and then we're hoping to release the processing software of that component, um, the estimation engine of that in, um, at the end of this month. And, um, and then hopefully um, in the next release, we'll be providing the real-time capability that as well. Um, so that is, that's where we're, we're heading to. We're looking at um, providing real-time updates um, and uh, improving the troposphere models that way. Um, this has been very much um, largely a collaborative effort. We've worked closely with the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, we've done a lot of work through Frontier SI. Um, we've worked with a lot of researchers from RMIT. Um, we've we relied on infrastructure from Oscope. Um, if we didn't have that network installed and the ground stations, we wouldn't be able to um, attain this dense network of observations to impact that. And we're reliant on the um, international community. So um, the RGS products that are coming for the orbits and clocks as well. And um, we have had, had a lot of help um, um, internally as well from um, the, the cloud enablement team and others to get this sort of um, service running in, in the cloud from in Amazon. So they've helped us um, make sure we have the computational um, power that we need to produce these results largely. Um, and I think that will pretty much cover um, everything that I wanted to cover today. So I think we're at the stage that we can now take questions if, if there are any. Um, okay. okay, great. Thank you very much, Mike. That was a really interesting uh, lecture and I'm going to moderate some questions now. Um, the first one comes from Mohamed al Kautsar and did you use meteorology? Um, I located nearby just to get um, an, um, a ballpark idea of how well it was performing. Um, when we actually provide the um, observations to the Bureau of Meteorology, um, we're actually just providing the Zenith troposphere delay and um, they're using the actual numerical weather model to obtain the pressure and the humidity and temperature to correct that to um, uh, um, an estimate of how much water vapor in there. And that um, works much more consistently in our models than us using the um, weather, um, weather observations than we have um, near the site. Um, the, to sort of elaborate that on a little bit more is um, we're actually also looking at taking those observations that we have at um, the GNS sites co-located with them and providing that to the Bureau of Meteorology. And that's also going into the weather forecasting system as well. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the next question um, is from Ernest Makalalat. Do you have climatological study on GNSS PWV using your network? And how were the results? Um, sorry, I, that, I read that literally, but you get the question, I hope. Yeah, so um, there is a growing interest in um, using the um, CTD estimates that get from GNS to understand the, more of the seasonal impacts um, that we see in the climatological um, impacts we have in there. Um, I, um, I'm, there have been a couple of papers that have used the Australian network. I think it was um, by Sula and Choi at RMIT or, um, or someone from RMIT who has looked at the Australian network and looked at the climatological effects. Um, what is um, happening with the RGS is we're doing um, a large reprocessing effort and that's involving a network of the whole globe. And it's a time series of around about 25 years. And we're getting a lot of um, interest from uh, the, the meteorological community and the climatological community to take those results that we get from um, our processing to determine the reference frame. Um, and we're asking all of the analysis centers to actually, well, don't just give us your position and velocities, give us your troposphere estimates as well. And they're taking those results, combining them themselves and looking at the climate effects. And I think that's, that's being, read, um, being led by Rosa Passiani from um, Italy. Um, there's an IIG special group looking at the climate and cultural effects and how you can use genus observations to better understand um, uh, the greenhouse impact and um, what, what they can do to improve the seasonal models as well. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's um, certainly um, a growing area of research and um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what results come from that. Great, thank you. Next question um, from Mahesh Tapa. Um, Australia is quite a variable distribution of core stations. And does the density of stations have a significant impact on the forecast? Or I guess on the quality of your forecast? Um, yes. Uh, so uh, if, um, if I was to pull a map up again, 
um, you see that a lot of the, the bias of the stations is, is very dense around the capital cities and uh, like that, and it gets um, sparse as we move um, towards the northwest of Australia. Um, but we're still looking at um, uh, probably um, a distance of around about 200 kilometres um, between stations once the full um, MPI, um, the full national positioning infrastructure is, has been, been deployed by um, the, the operations team over the coming years. Um, and what that means is that um, it depends on the forecasting system you use. So the Bureau of Meteorology basically run three sort of scale models. They use a global uh, model. Um, so that takes in as much data as you can provide from uh, around the globe and it's uh, a much lower resolution. Then they do another forecasting model um, at the regional level. So they try and take all of the data that they have for Australia and um, they use that to update um, the capital city forecasts, which require a much higher resolution um, of observations um, there to get that things. Um, and those capital cities um, are generally um, reasonably dense for um, GNSS stations, um, for the network there. So um, it's actually quite fortuitous. The, the spacing works out really well for the regional models that the Bureau of Meteorology um, use and the spacing and the density that we have around capital cities um, currently and um, are, um, that have been provided by the states and um, other um, operators um, is uh, at, at the right level for the capital city forecastings as well. So um, to, to answer the question directly, yes, the, the, the spacing and density um, is important, um, but um, the, the way that things are set up is it seems to be set up very well, well for um, the way that the Bureau of Meteorology are looking at doing weather forecasting systems into the future. Great, thank you. Uh, I guess the next question is a, a follow-up on that. Um, Ms. Charisma Victoria Kayapan asks, what's the ideal interstation distance for GPS MET? Um, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I guess it, I, I don't know what the ideal spatial resolution was. It would depend on the event and it would depend on the numerical weather model you're using. Um, for So um, let's, let's take the extreme case of where we want to um, be able to do now casting and we want things in real time and we want to be able to pick up um, storm events that are um, that can happen very suddenly, um, and um, I and I'm, I'm going to hazard a guess, but I don't think you should take it as an authoritative answer. That should come from a meteorologist. I'd, I'd say it'd be around about two to five kilometres you need um, to to be able to pick um, those kind of events up. Um, but uh, yeah, I would pref I think it would be um, an, a question I'd refer to John LaMarshall or one of the one of the, the other meteorology forecasting experts. Okay, great. Well, the next one, and they don't stop the questions. Uh, Simon McCluskey uh, actually <laughs> asked about the temporal resolution of GNSS ZTD uh, that is provided to the bomb for assimilation into access. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we, we, we're providing the temporal resolution at um, an hourly rate. Um, so um, every hour we um, process 24 hours of observations and we're providing ZTD estimates for the last 24 hours every hour and then it gets updated um, every hour. Um, what is nice about um, the, the project that um, we're working for the ACS software is it's being written in a common filter. And what that can do is um, we can actually think of it as more of a stochastic sort of variable and we can provide a higher resolution of update. And um, it also has the possibility of doing forward and backward smoothing in there. So we can actually get um, a much better solution um, out of there. So that's going to be an, uh, um, an exciting application of that toolkit. And um, right. yeah, looking forward to running it and testing it out. Great. Okay, I think there's the last two questions coming now. How will this, uh, this is from John Menzies, how will this impact our understanding of IOD and ENSO, etc., which have a significant impact, obviously, on the Australian climate system? There's little meteorological data available in the mid-ocean, uh, Indian and Pacific Oceans. Will this improve that? Um, no, I, um, I don't think this is the, the answer to everything. Um, we, we are um, a fraction of what can help improve weather forecasting. Um, a lot of that sounds like um, it's oceanographic and the, the, those sort of observations are very important. We still need those boys and we still need to know how, understand what's happening with the oceans and um, uh, other meteorological impacts. So, um, 
so understanding the IOD and, and those kind of things require um, uh, other observations as well. Um, but uh, over the landmass, and um, even with GPS buoys, I think um, Chris Watson has done a bit of work on that as well. Um, there's the potential to to use that to enhance our understanding of the climate, and yeah. um, so we're not the solution, but we're part of the solution. That's always a good start. Okay, the final question from Aaron Hammond: uh, Do they get a single value per station or per station satellite pair? Um, so currently um, you get a single value per station. So that's, um, you get a ZTD that's mapped up directly above the station. Um, we have looked at it, um, looking at gradients. So you can get more than one observation. You can get how much the atmosphere is varying to the north or to the south, or you can break it up into a higher resolution. Um, but generally it's only um, one, one, one or a handful of um, ZTD estimates per station. Um, this sort of gets into the, the nitty gritty. Um, there's only so many um, variables you can estimate um, in the mathematics of it. And um, the, you can't do it um, per, per range, per, per satellite, um, just because there'll be too many unknowns and you would never get an answer. Great. Okay, thank you. Well, I would like to thank you again for a, a great um, lecture. And as a token of appreciation in GA, we always give the presenter of these uh, distinguished lecture series a gift. Now, we're not actually located uh, next to each other uh, at the moment. We're, so I'm virtually going to hand you a gift. Let's see if this works over the ether. Here is the gift. And Michael? Oh, oh, thank you. Well, there we are. This is the um, token of appreciation for a great lecture on cloudy and a chance of noise. Um, before we, um, sorry, Craig, no meatballs for Michael. Um, <laughs> before we go, uh, Dodo, I would like to draw the audience's attention to next week's, next week's lecture in this series. It's again, uh, another distinguished lecture um, that GA is hosting. And it'll be done by a, another colleague of Michael and myself, uh, Anna Riddell. And Anna Riddell will be talking about what goes up must come down or why is Australia sinking? And her presentation will explore how the Australian plate is moving and what that means for applications of precise positioning. So I expect this will be another cracking talk at 11 a.m. next Wednesday or whatever the time is in your time zone. And I hope to see you then and there. And thanks very much, everybody, for attending. And thanks again to Michael. See you next week. Thank you.